Good afternoon. Welcome to the Bridging the Gap Between What We Know and What We Do, Opportunities for the Breakthrough Series Collaborative to Implement Improvements in Early Childhood Systems session. The session will explore the implementation of shared learning strategies using an example of a continuous quality improvement methodology, the Breakthrough Series Collaborative, otherwise known as BSC. The example will offer insights into key components believed to be important for creating sustainable quality improvements in early care and education settings. The presenters will share about the BSC methodology and how it was used in a recent study aimed at supporting children's social and emotional learning. The study demonstrates the feasibility of implementing the BSC in ECE settings, suggesting it is a promising approach for states to consider for their early childhood um, education systems. We have a great session planned and encourage everyone to use the chat feature to respond to presenters for any questions. Um, but before we get started, go over a couple of housekeeping items. If you could please change your Zoom name to reflect your name and the state that you're representing. This way we know who's in the room. And I'm just gonna wait for a second so you can see the instructions, how to do that if you haven't done so already. And if you have called in on your phone and need to, we're gonna be going into breakout rooms. So you'll need to sync your phone with your Zoom picture. So this way it doesn't, um, your phone is not in one breakout room and your Zoom um, and the computer is in another room. Um, here are the instructions on how to sync that. And then as always, if you have any questions um, or have any ideas that you um, want to present, please feel free to ask them in the chat. And then if you could please all put yourself on mute so the background noise won't interfere um, with the presentation. All right. Oops. It is my honor um, to introduce our presenters. We have Sarah Blankenship. Um, she's a child care program specialist at the Office of Planning and Research and Evaluation. We are also joined by Dr. Ann Douglas, who is the executive director at the Institute for Early Education Leadership and Innovation, and a professor and program director at the College of Education and Human Development for the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And Dr. Tamara Haley, a senior scholar of early childhood research at Child Trends. I'm gonna turn it over to Tamara to get us started. Thank you so much, Faith, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tamara Halley, and um, my colleague Ann Douglas and I are delighted to be here with you this afternoon to share some recent findings from um, our study, the Culture of Continuous Learning Project. Can you share the slides? Yep. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so our project team includes researchers from Child Trends and from the University of Massachusetts, Boston, as well as our colleagues, Jennifer Agosti from JRA Consulting and Stephanie Doyle from the Center for the Study of Social Policy. Next slide. Um, we also want to acknowledge our funders um, from OPRE and they include um, our project officer, Nina Philipson, Ivelisse Martinez-Beck, Sarah Blankenship, Amy Madigan, and Paula Denieri. And we're delighted to have Sarah Blankenship with us this afternoon to share with us um, some of OPRE's motivation for this study. So, um, Sarah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Blankenship, and I work with my colleagues in ACF's Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation to oversee the Culture of Continuous Learning Project. Unfortunately, our federal project officer, Nina Philipson, who is listed in the program, is unexpectedly out today, so I will be stepping in for her to share a bit of context around why ACF embarked on this project to examine whether a breakthrough series collaborative is a feasible tool for supporting continuous quality improvement in early care and education. So because ongoing assessment and use of data to improve quality and early childhood programs are growing areas of focus for both child care and Head Start programs, ACF was and continues to be interested in understanding how quality improvement 
can be institutionalized and sustained to create a culture of ongoing quality improvement at the program level. So data use and quality improvement activities have largely been driven by requirements placed on programs such as the Head Start designation re renewal system or state QRIS systems. But collection of data within early childhood programs driven by monitoring goals is not necessarily the best type of data to inform the individual programs for their own quality improvement. We also know from implementation science that data collection and use are just one piece of what's necessary for continuous quality improvement to happen within programs. Other key components that need to be in place include strong implementation teams, which represent the many different stakeholders involved, center, director, teachers, parents, and provide leadership around both implementation strategies and the initiative or program goal of interest. The use of data and feedback loops, which can occur at any level of a program and should ultimately work across levels of organizational structure. These loops are often signified as the plan, do, study, act cycles, and sustainable infrastructure and organizational capacity. Individuals need appropriate training and technical assistance to implement practice changes and improvements, but organizational structures must also be in place to create a culture of supportive change with appropriate infrastructure to support use of data and the work of implementation teams. The goal of using these key components together and implementation science more broadly is to address the gap between science, what we know, and practice, what we do. So the Breakthrough Series collaborative model is built around these key components to help programs use data for continuous quality improvement. At OPRE, when we first learned about the BSC, we got very excited about the idea of trying it out in ECE and embarked on this ambitious project. We just finished phase one of this work, which we will focus uh, on today. And just last month, we funded phase two, which will continue to explore the BSC and ECE settings. I do apologize, but I will have to quietly drop off, drop off at 4 Eastern to attend another meeting, but the CCL project team has a great session planned for you today. And they'll explain how we implemented the BSC in ECE settings and examined its feasibility for use in ECE programs. We'll hear a little bit about how the BSC fits with current quality improvement strategies used in states and how it addresses some common challenges, the theory of change behind the BSC, including more about its key components, and some details about what we learned from our feasibility study. So thank you to everyone for joining us today and I'll pass it off to our project team to take it from here. Wonderful, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, Faith already introduced um, Anne and myself. So this is just um, our credentials uh, for you that we're representing our entire uh, culture of continuous learning project team today. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, um, this is our agenda for today's presentation. First, Anne is going to provide an overview of quality improvement systems in early care and education and discuss the quality improvement strategies that states are using. And she'll be introducing a new framework that we developed during phase one of our project that categorizes these strategies along two distinct continuums. Then Anne will give an overview of how the Breakthrough Series Collaborative, which we call BSC for short, um, fits into this continuum of quality improvement strategies. And she'll describe the theory of change that our team developed and why we think the BSC may be a promising strategy to use for quality improvement initiatives. Then I'll share some um, findings from the phase one of our Culture of Continuous Learning project. And, um, then we'll have some breakout groups to discuss and ask questions and make connections with what you're doing in your states. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass things off to Anne to get us started. Great. Thanks, Tamara. So the purpose of quality improvement in state systems is to support and enable early childhood programs to engage in quality improvement activities and to achieve and sustain high levels of quality as a result. 
So EC, uh, EC systems are providing financial support now through things like CCDF, Head Start and Early Head Start and state pre-kindergarten initiatives. And the quality improvement initiatives supported through these dollars target a range of levers for quality. Uh, it might be policies, standards, regulations, financial incentives, and of course, training and technical assistance. State, regional, and other systems uh, quality improvement systems support professional development in a variety of ways. So professional development is one of these uh, training and technical assistance levers for quality improvements that systems use. Because the foundation for high quality is the quality of teaching and caregiving, professional development is a key strategic lever for quality improvement, and um, it's designed to increase knowledge and or support practice change. Next slide. A challenge is that many professional development systems and efforts have not achieved their desired outcome when it comes to quality improvement. So that's the challenge that we really have in front of us is how do we um, ensure that these um, professional development approaches um, have the impact that we want, that we get the impact that this investment um, is intended to get. There's many challenges that exist to implementing professional development in ways that result in sustained or sustainable changes. And so this slide shows uh, a number of those challenges. Among those challenges is determining what level to direct the supports. How is professional development most impactful? How is it typically directed? Is it directed just at a director or an administrator? Is it directed at a whole program engaging people across the organization? Is it engaging one individual in a classroom um, or educators. Another area of challenge is leadership. If or how center leaders are engaged in promoting leadership among staff, creating systems and structures that elevate teacher voice and agency as active agents of change, or are they objects of change? And how is equity promoted? Who receives these supports? What do they receive? In what ways is it matched to their needs? And does it recognize and center their expertise and strengths? These challenges of quality improvement have become even more pronounced during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which has exacerbated uh, some of the conditions for the ECE workforce, such as low compensation and the lack of workplace supports, um, in some cases, lacks of benefits or paid planning time or supportive career pathways. And it's created economic insecurity and turnover among the workforce, particularly staff working in childcare centers. Um, and that much of this preceded the pandemic, but it's been exacerbated. Conditions of the Child Care and Head Start work environment have been, in some cases, associated with job stress, burnout, depressive symptoms that are detrimental to staff and children and families they serve. Um, the lack of planning time, leadership capacity, or limited opportunities for collaboration, or low levels of psychological safety in the workplace can create lower quality environments for children and make it challenging for teachers and administrators to engage in meaningful quality improvement. So that's a pretty, I hate this slide, uh, such an overwhelming, um, you know, so many obstacles and challenges. So let's go to the next slide. So the Breakthrough Series Collaborative, sometimes referred to as the BSC, has, as has been mentioned, is an evidence-based quality improvement methodology that has been used and tested for years in the healthcare sector, um, as well as in child welfare, um, but only recently in early care and education. And it has a distinct theory of change that differs from what we might think of as training or coaching as usual. And it was designed even decades ago to overcome the very barriers and weaknesses of some of, of some more traditional approaches to professional development and quality improvement that are mentioned on that prior slide. The BSC is rooted in a theory of change that recognizes that we are unlikely to get quality improvement results if we focused only on individual teachers without also building organizational and leadership capacity to enable and sustain individual or classroom change. So this is really grounded in system thinking and the research about what impedes or what enables quality improvement. So these on this slide are some of the key elements, what we call mechanisms in our theory of change, which I'll talk about in a minute. And these things explain how a BSC gets a different kind of result. Um, and that is by mobilizing leadership 
for change and improvement at all levels of an organization, uh, working with cross role teams of teachers, administrators, and parents. It involves creating structures and routines in which teams learn from and with other teams to accelerate improvement. Uh, this is also called job embedded professional learning. Uh, it involves using data to guide improvements, growing an organizational system and culture of collaborative learning and psychological safety that allows staff to test new ways to get better outcomes, and promoting an inquiry mindset that is infused through all of this. So in the CCL project, we used the BSC methodology to focus on improving social emotional learning. But the, and so that's what you'll hear a lot about in this presentation, but the BSC can be used and has been used to improve other domains of practice and program quality. It can be used to address health and safety, uh, domains of literacy, cultural competence, trauma-informed practice. So there have been BSCs in early care and education settings on all of those topics and, and in other sectors on many other topics as well. Next slide. So systems use a variety of approaches and strategies to support quality improvement, and many of these focus on workforce and professional development. And so as, as Tamara mentioned, as part of the phase one of the Culture of Continuous Learning project, uh, we developed this matrix, and it consists of four quadrants that present the professional development strategies according to two characteristics, whether they're intended to engage individuals or intended to engage whole organizations or teams of or in organizations. So you can see that the spectrum along the bottom of the slide there moving left to right is that going from individual to organizational. And then the second dimension that is represented in this matrix is whether the professional development is designed to increase participant knowledge or whether it's intended to, in to support participants to implement changes in the workplace, to apply their knowledge to practice. So one is about knowledge gain and one is about application of knowledge. And again, it's a spectrum. So the boxes on the left side of the matrix are quadrants one and two. They are approaches that engage individuals. Whereas the boxes on the right side, quadrants three and four, engage whole organizations or teams of people from an organization or a system. Training and coaching delivered to individuals falls on the left. Whereas approaches that engage organizations through coaching or training for a team or all staff within a program fall on the right side. The boxes in the bottom row of the matrix are quadrants one and four, and they focus on increasing knowledge, while the boxes in the top row of the matrix, quadrants two and three, address the transfer of knowledge, the application of knowledge to practice. So they focus on practice change, not knowledge gain. Studies suggest that the most commonly used strategies in our systems fall in quadrants one and two, individual training and individual coaching, with less attention, less investment in quadrants three and four. One way, and I hope that during our groups, breakout groups and discussion at the end, we can think more about this, but one way this matrix can be used or that just the framework of this um, is as a tool for reviewing current services and systems, placing them along the matrix and the quadrants. This system assessment can help with identifying where system efforts and resources are distributed or concentrated currently, and whether there are opportunities to leverage higher impact or additional or the full spectrum of professional development approaches to achieve the greatest possible impact from professional development investments. Next slide. So the Breakthrough Series Collaborative, the BSC, makes a unique contribution in this matrix of PD supports. It's an evidence-based strategy that falls in that third quadrant where we have found there tend to be fewer investments and fewer approaches being used. The BSC is an organizational and team coaching strategy. It focuses on supporting whole organizations and teams to apply knowledge about evidence-based practices into their daily routines of practice in, in sustainable ways that achieve quality. So now we'll discuss what's important about this third quadrant, how it can play an important role in overcoming some of the challenges we face when it comes to getting positive outcomes for quality improvement investments. Next slide, thanks. So what do quality, uh, what do quadrant three strategies or innovations offer? What do they bring to the table or to our toolkit? 
interest in quality improvement grows out of the desire for better results when it comes to quality and the capacity to measurably improve quality through various kinds of interventions and policies. There is so much research on quality improvement in other sectors and industries that um, really can inform our understanding about this as we kind of emerge this area of practice in our own sector. And it enables us to assess or theorize what might, um, what am I to apply or what might be different in our context in, in the early childhood systems and settings. So what do they add to our toolkit? So um, the slide lists uh, a couple of these, a uh, couple of these things: um, system thinking and research on how organizations achieve quality outcomes. Is clear that improvement requires shifts across levels and parts of a system. It's helpful to think about teaching quality not as a property of individuals, of individual teachers, but think about teaching quality as a property of the organization. Organizational interventions or su and supports can help us achieve lasting impact. Individuals, individual teachers, for example, may not be able to reap the benefits of individual training and coaching without shifts to make the work environment supportive and enabling and sustaining of their changes in practice. Uh, research has also shown that adults change their behaviors or work practices when they have opportunities to learn collaboratively with others they work with. Uh, the voice, agency, and leadership of teachers is essential when it comes to problem solving and testing new strategies to achieve improvement outcomes. And lastly, the science of improvement has shown that continuous learning and improvement involves using data, reflecting on data, trying new strategies, and adapting them based on data. So this is an essential element of sustainable quality improvement, and it reflects a mindset shift for many, uh, which is really the adoption um, and the enhancement of an inquiry mindset. Next slide. So now I'm going to share more about the BSC, uh, and how it actually works in practice when it's implemented with early childhood programs and teams. And this will all continue to illustrate how a quadrant three strategy works and what it offers that might be different from uh, more traditional offerings in our sector. So what is the BSC approach? The BSC um, has, this is our, our strategy um, for how the BSC works. Uh, this comes from our uh, um, literature review and theory of change, um, which are documents that are um, available um, online if you'd like to read more about them. Uh, or share them with other people. So a BSC have, has five these five key elements that operate together in a dynamic way to achieve improvement and quality that's sustained over time. Um, many other kinds of CQI programs use one or two of these. So one feature of the BSC is the integration of all five of these as the active ingredients of this approach. So what are they? The first is a multi, is multi-level inclusive teams. Rather than engaging a single individual, the BSC engages a cross-role team. And in our study, that involved those cross-role teams involve teachers, administrators, and parents. The BSC uses content experts, team coaches that are sometimes referred to as faculty. Um, they help deliver content knowledge, they support and empower the team members in their roles, and they support teams progress. So there's a group of coaches who coach teams. There's a shared learning environment. That means that teams learn together within and across the teams. They come together in facilitated in-person meetings. There are regular calls. There's online discussion forums to support collaboration and provide uh, guidance on the improvement process um, within this collaborative learning community. There is a change framework. This is the roadmap that establishes the shared goals and shared knowledges, knowledge about what the key levers or drivers of change are. So this is a very goal-oriented process. It's informed by evidence-based practices, evidence about how to achieve the specific aims of the project. So in our, pro in our BSC, the focus was on social emotional learning. So this change framework was grounded in the evidence based framework from the pyramid model about best practices for supporting social emotional learning. So this is the content piece. Sometimes people think, well, there's all these different, there's teams and there's, uh, you know, there's coaches. Um, what's the content? This is the content. It lives in this change framework uh, grounded in evidence-based practice. And the whole BSC is intended to support um, 
the, the implementation of those best practices into daily routines. Uh, and then lastly, the fifth component is the model for improvement. And this is the improvement science tools of using PDSA, plan, do, study, act cycles, collecting and reflecting on data uh, as you test changes to see if they result in improvement. So this is a set of improvement tools, protocols, concepts um, that teams are, uh, there's a lot of capacity building about how to use these tools for continuous quality improvement to support this work. So together, these elements make up the BSC and aim to support the implementation and the sustainability of evidence-based social emotional learning practices in the real world, world context of early care and education centers in this study. Next slide. So this is what kind of the process looks like when it's implemented, how these are these five elements I just talked about are actually rolled out over time. So before the process starts with the teams, the BSC uh, implementation team, the staff who deliver the BSC, um, they convene and train the coaches, the faculty coaches, they refine or finalize that change framework I talked about. They establish the metrics for tracking improvement. Those are the, the data points that teams will collect to know um, whether, you know, what, what strategies are working to achieve the improvements they're trying to achieve. So there will be a set of monthly metrics that are shared across all the teams and reported across all the teams. Uh, a trained BSC improvement advisor leads the process. So this, this is often a consultant um, or someone who's specially trained to lead a BSC. And they begin with a pre-work phase to plan for the process. Teams from different uh, organizations apply or are enrolled in the BSC. So there's a, a recruitment process for teams to kind of sign on or apply uh, and be selected and begin this process. And so then what you see here is a cycle. The, of what of where there are learning sessions, um, often on a, for example a quarterly basis, and uh, all the teams come together for a learning session. They learn about continuous quality improvement tools. They learn about uh, the social emotional learning uh, evidence based practices, and they learn how to test changes to reach their specific SEL quality uh, goals. In between each of those learning sessions are what we call action periods. And this is where teams are working together in their programs, testing changes, tracking and reflecting on their metrics and their data, getting support from the BSC staff and the faculty through monthly calls. They have affinity groups. So all the teachers have a monthly call, all the directors have a monthly call and, uh, and the teams are getting coaches, coaching. And this cycle repeats over the period of about 12 to 18 months on a typical BSC. Next slide. When the BSC strategy is implemented effectively, the result is a series of outputs. So this is kind of digging into our theory of change. And again, um, we have a theory of change we can share um, with people um, to, that's a, you know, a published document. Um, the first level of these outputs that result from the implementation of the BSC includes a set of activities and products of the process. So um, there are these monthly metrics, there are PDSAs that teams are engaging in, the learning sessions are happening, um, coaches are consulting with the teams. These BSC activities reflect the implementation of the BSC and they produce a set of new structures and work processes uh, in the programs that are participating. So for example, the BSC process creates a structure for a set of meetings uh, these structures create new routines for collaborative professional learning. They build an organizational infrastructure for, for people to learn together. They build relationships. They improve the communication across roles within the organization. So these are really important things that are produced as a result of the BSC process specifically. Uh, the activity, the BSC activities also produce a set of new work process approaches. And by that we mean, for example, the BSC teaches participants how to change their practice by using tools to collect data, to use data to inform their tests of change. And this enables participants to begin developing and testing changes in their practices immediately. Next slide. Yep. Next, the BSC strategy and its outputs are hypothesized to influence a set of mechanisms. So these are the causal link or the pathway for how the BSC gets to these better outcomes. So 
the BSC influences relational dynamics, both within and across the participating centers in ways that engage center leaders and directors in collaborative leading change. The BSC is designed to shift individuals' mindsets away from a compliance mindset and a one-size-fits-all approach to a mindset that is focused on learning, adaptation, and testing ideas about how to implement improvements. The first mechanism in the relational dynamics within the participating uh, is the relational dynamics within teams. There's a shift in psychological safety as people begin to feel more safety about sharing their opinions, voicing a new or different idea, taking initiative to test a change on their own, sharing data and learning from failures as well as successes, and learning from one another. Research in the field of management has identified psychological safety as a critical factor in organizational learning, innovation, and improvement. Team members experience an increase in self-efficacy also and begin to be empowered to generate ideas and test changes. In addition, the power dynamics among participants shift. So frontline staff and parents' expertise are as respected and valued as the perspective of administrators. This creates a parallel process in which relationships across the organization and its various roles are characterized by mutual respect. These relational shifts promote interorganizational learning and fuels continuous improvement. So we're really digging into the active ingredients, what's really going on that makes change happen and be sustained. Um, and it's this really deep relational and um, uh, interactional um, dynamics that seem to, to matter uh, so much. The second mechanism is a shift in relational dyna dynamics among organizations as participants hear from others and learn from their mistakes and successes. So a really unique feature of the BSC is the collaborative learning that is facilitated among the teams from different organizations. And this can accelerate improvement by exposing people to new ideas that they may not have considered, as well as opportunities to learn from the success and failures of others. And finally, the third mechanism is this inquiry mindset I mentioned already, um, one that's oriented to problem solving. With an inquiry mindset, participants approach the problems of practice with curiosity, a desire to inquire and test new solutions and strategies, and to learn what works and what might not work. People come to learn how data gives them greater visibility into problems and insights into their ideas. So using data in everyday practice helps the BSC participants know if they're heading in the right Right direction in their ideas and their tests for improvement. Next slide. The BSC is unique because it explicitly calls out that having these trusting relationships, this developing leadership, essential ingredients for quality improvement. Next slide. In the CCL project, we developed an implementation field guide um, that can be used by teams who are implementing a BSC. And in the field guide, we called all of this um, the secret sauce. And this is the relational dynamics, the distributed leadership, and the respect for each team member's expertise. Next slide. All of this. Uh, is then hypothesized in our theory of change to result in these outcomes and this impact. So both the outcomes and impact on the organizational culture of continuous learning and leadership, and also for the social and emotional learning outcomes and impact for children and families. So now I'm going to turn it over to Tamara to share uh, about the research study that we conducted um, and that really kind of ex tested and explored um, all of what we have in this theory of change. Thanks so much, Anne. So um, now I'm gonna share with you all some of the findings from the research study that accompanied the implementation of the BSC that focused on social and emotional learning that was part of phase one of the Culture of Continuous Learning project. Next slide. Okay, so um, in phase one of the project, we studied uh, the implementation of a BSC and explicitly to examine the feasibility of using this methodology in early care and education settings, both Head Start and child care center-based settings. And this was a small pilot study with seven pro uh, center-based programs in one community. 
And we used an embedded case study design for this study. Um, and that is that the seven programs were embedded within a single case of implementing the BSC in early care and education settings. We used mixed, mixed methods for this study. And what we mean by that is multiple kinds of data sources. So for example, surveys that could provide us with some more quantitative information, as well as interviews and focus groups that provided more qualitative information from um, the participants in this, in this initiative. And we gathered information from both uh, the early childhood programs that were participating in the BSC, as well as those who were implementing the BSC, so the BSC implementation team. So we had two different um, kind of stakeholder groups and key informants that were part of this study. And even though it was a very um, small case study, uh, what you're gonna be seeing are just more descriptive findings that I'm gonna present. And we couldn't really do um, you know, analyses that provided statistical significance, but we did triangulate information across the different data sources. So what I'll be presenting are findings that are um, were indicative of more than one instance of noting this, this phenomenon that we're, we're sharing. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, for this particular BSC, it lasted um, 12 months and then had a six month sustainability period. So the research team collected data from the participants over the course of 18 months. And as Anne mentioned, um, the content of this BSC was social and emotional learning and the pyramid model was the basis for the change framework for the project. Next slide. Okay, so um, with the study findings, our quest, uh, we followed three research questions, which also aligned with our theory of change. So the first research question was, um, to what extent did the programs engage with the BSC and participate in the activities offered to the teams? So thinking back to our theory of change, this research question is really looking at the outputs of the BSC that was implemented. Our second question, was how successfully did programs develop a culture of continuous learning? And here we're focusing on those mechanisms or the secret sauce, as Anne mentioned. Um, can, did we detect that there were um, there was evidence of programs sharing information and learning from each other across programs and also within programs? And was there evidence of um, shifts in mindset among those who are participating in the BSC? And then finally, was there initial evidence that participating in a BSC resulted in desired outcomes related to teaching practices and organizational culture? And here we were focused um, mostly on the short-term outcomes in our theory of change, not the long-term impacts. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, first with regard to BSC participation, we found that programs varied in their capacity to engage in the BSC. So for example, program participation in specific BSC activities such as attending learning sessions or completing monthly metrics seem to vary across programs and over time. And what we um, concluded from this is looking at the pattern of participation, we identified two programs of the seven that seem to, for, for whatever reason, be able to participate in more of the BSC activities or to be doing those BSC activities more consistently over time. And those two programs of the seven were identified as what we called robust participation programs. And the remaining five programs we identified or called them moderate participation programs. So we wanted to emphasize that none of the programs were not participating in the BSC, but some seemed to have an easier time of engaging or were more robustly engaging with the BSC. Um, however, all participants reported enjoying and appreciating participating in the BSC activities and found them uh, different from other quality improvement initiatives they've experienced in the past. And here on this slide, there's an example of a quote from a center administrator who shared um, a couple of different points that are highlighted in blue in this, in this quote that e exemplify how the BSC is different. So this 
uh, administrator said, the way that the BSC really does well is getting as many people involved in it as possible, including a parent which has never been successful either here or at the other program before. But it's the fact that it really engages and involves people. There are small pieces that individuals can do, and then they're built to be really successful, and that really engages people and encourages them to do more because they see the immediate effects of making one small change. So in this one quote, we see um, a couple of different features of the BSC that, that are unique and important and engaging for these programs. It's engaging multiple people, those cross-role teams. It's using, making small changes and, and seeing, gathering data to see whether that small change makes a difference in practice and how that can be very motivating for individuals. Next slide. Okay, so um, the next finding is around developing this culture of continuous learning. And we did set, have some evidence um, that participants reported both sharing across and within their programs, different things that they were learning. And also importantly, the development of, uh, of an inquiry mindset. And this quote exemplifies some of those shifts in mindset that have to do with supporting people, being, uh, being curious, um, feeling safe to make changes and, and even changes that might result in um, not failure, but you know, you, you try something to see if it improves, but maybe it doesn't improve. So you need to try something else. And even that permission for trying something out that might not lead to something that, that sh shares improvement is, is part of this inquiry mindset and, and creating a psychologically safe place to, to try things out. So this center administrator said that uh, she was really talking to people more as a supervisor about saying, I'm not asking you for perfection. I'm just asking you to look at one thing you think you can change and work on and let's check in about it and see how it goes. You know, I think it makes people feel that they are better supported in this way. So this was a way that the administrator was signaling to those who were participating that it's okay to try something out. I'm not asking you to be perfect. I want you to try something. And even if it fails, that mistake is going to um, allow us, or not mistake, but it allows you to try something out and it be a failure, let's say, in terms of uh, getting the outcome that you're, you're looking for but it's still information, it's still data that you can use to help improve in a continuous quality improvement um, context. Next slide. Oh, um, before we go to this slide, I just wanted to mention that there were a couple of different characteristics. If we can go back to the last slide, just so I can share this thought about, um, it's back to the mechanism slide with a quote. That one, yes. Um, so Anne mentioned a couple of different um, mechanisms that happen around psychological safety and efficacy. And we found that the um, that personal efficacy on the part of both the director and the uh, teachers, as well as a sense of psychological safety, those did distinguish the programs that we had identified as robust participation programs from the modest participation programs in the sense that um, when we measured these, these constructs in pre-post surveys, we found that those programs that were identified as robust participation programs tended to have higher scores on psychological safety, both at the beginning and over time, um, whereas the um, more moderate or modest participation programs tended to have lower um, assessments of psychological safety and self-efficacy at the beginning, but showed some improvement over time. So I wanted to point that out, that there was movement in those, in those constructs that were related to that secret sauce that Anne mentioned. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So um, with regard to the short-term outcomes, we did find some preliminary evidence of changes in teaching practices and organizational culture. So we found um, that there, were there was 
even though there was little change in beliefs around social emotional learning, those tended to be high across the board from beginning of the project to the end. But we found that shared learning increased and knowledge of strategies to support continuous improvement increased, as well as indications that leadership across levels and, um, and feelings of a positive organizational culture and climate increased over time. And we have some, some beginning evidence, although it's short term, that we only looked over six months, that there was some ability to sustain changes over time, at least as reported by um, the participants. So um, after th these, we, we concluded that these findings are, um, you know, that we, that we have evidence that the BSC is feasible to implement in early care and education settings. Um, that it's a promising strategy that addresses some of the challenges that are currently faced in quality improvement initiatives in this sector. But there's further testing that we need to do um, with larger samples to um, be on this pilot pro pro project that was in phase one. And as um, Sarah mentioned, Sarah Blankenship mentioned, we are delighted that we are launching phase two of this project. And we're very excited that we'll be testing the feasibility of this breakthrough series collaborative um, methodology on a larger scale and looking specifically ab about um, questions of feasibility of implementing this or embedding this methodology within state and Head Start quality improvement systems. And the first activity that we're doing um, in part of the phase two project is a landscape survey that will be done to try to get the lay of the land of what business as usual looks like in terms of quality improvement methodologies within such systems. And we're gonna be using that matrix that Anne um, shared with you earlier in the presentation today as a framework for categorizing the types of quality improvement initiatives we've encountered in the landscape. So we're very excited about that. And if you turn to the next slide, um, we, we are gonna go now to breakout rooms, but I wanted to mention that um, if you have any questions about the theory of change or um, the design of our feasibility study from phase one or anything about our phase two activities, we're happy to answer that in you know, questions during the breakout um, groups. But in general, we really wanted this opportunity to take some time. Um, and how much time do we have for the breakouts? We're gonna do breakouts for about 15 minutes. Okay, great. So what we really would like um, to, to focus on is how this information we've shared with you today connects with um, what you already knew about quality improvement approaches or the Breakthrough Series Collaborative methodology in particular. And how, how do these ideas broaden your thinking about um, what you're currently doing in your own in, um, context in your state? And then also think about challenges. What's what are what's still challenging to you or to the field? And what new questions has this presentation raised for you? So we're going to go out into two breakout groups. Anne will be in one, and I'll be in the other. And we look forward to um, to speaking with you about these ideas. Okay, they're all in breakup room now. What? They are in breakup room now. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I'm it's okay. Check, I'm, I'm gonna check how they're doing. Bye. Okay. All right, 30 seconds. Okay.
All right. Great. I, I'm assuming we're all back now in our group. And Tamara and I are going to just share back a little bit of um, kind of the ideas that were shared in each of the breakout um, before we move to kind of wrap up. Tamara, do you want to start or do you want me to start? I'm, I'm happy to start. I'm happy Thanks. to start. Um, so we had, we had um, some clarifying questions. There were some questions about exactly what did you do for those 12 months and how was that different during the six month sustainability versus what you did in the 12 month ESC? And so I shared that the forthcoming field guide that Anne mentioned will have a lot of details uh, and examples of kind of step-by-step -step how, how one would implement uh, a BSC uh, in the future within early care and education using the, um, the social emotional learning BSC that we did in phase one as an example throughout the, the guidebook. Um, and I stress that each BSC is unique and is adapted and, and um, for its particular context. So even though there are examples of agendas for learning sessions, let's say that are available in the appendices of the field guide, that those are just examples and you really should develop your own unique agendas um, for your, your unique context. And especially if you're using a different content uh, other than the social emotional learning content, um, then you should definitely be using different, different materials. But we just shared them as examples because we know that there's um, a lot of different intricacies to, to doing this. Um, Caitlin from uh, Caitlin Gleason from Delaware shared that um, her reflection that this is really what we presented today was really a paradigm shift and it's not an add on to what people are doing, but a, and it's not an initiative, it is just a new way of doing things and, and she encouraged us when we do get to the point in our phase two work for um, looking to states or systems to participate in phase two of the phase two study where we're actually implementing a BSC within a system embed, embedded within a system and studying its feasibility that they understand that this is not like a one-off thing this is not um, an add-on to what they're doing but it is a different way of doing what they're already doing um, and so I, I appreciated that um, recommendation and reminder, because I realized uh, just reflecting on my own language in this presentation, I think I used the word initiative several times, and it's it's mostly, that's not quite right. It's a methodology that is implemented and a new way of doing what one is already trying to do, and that's reflected in the title of our presentation, which is going from what we know to what, what we're doing um, and, and fixing that gap. Um, there were questions about supports being in place for the programs to be able to participate in a BSC. And I mentioned that during the application process, we ask about what programs had available to them in terms of resources for professional development and quality improvement. And with those that participated that um, in the BSC were also given some funds to help with participation in whatever way they saw fit. So the fun, it was extra funding given directly to the programs. And some of them, they use them for different things, but it could be used, for instance, to pay for substitute teachers so that the teachers could attend the learning sessions and things like that. And we also discussed um, the challenge of the staffing shortage in, in that community and just in general now with um, the pandemic, that that is something that's going to be challenging for phase two of um, our project and that we're thinking about doing things a little bit differently in terms of how we deliver the learning sessions when, when those learning sessions occur, time of day, day of week, um, things like that. And then finally, um, we were talking about phase two and whether certain states might be interested in participating in the next pilot and feasibility study in phase two. And, um, some folks from Vermont mentioned that it, it could be um, possible, but it really depends on leadership buy-in and um, that there's just interest in using um, 
Vermont also said that um, the the matrix, the four quadrant matrix, was was a very good um, visual for them to think about the different um, instances and different players and ways that these different quality improvement was happening either at the individual level or at a systems level, and they appreciated that that rubric. That is my summary. Great, thanks, Tamara. So I'll just add um, some additional things that um, we talked about in the breakout group that I was in. So I'll start with that with the matrix um, and also some um, interest in that and seeing that as, as a helpful tool. And um, I'm sometime in coming weeks or months, um, that tool will be available in the form of a brief. Um, and um, so that's something that uh, at the it should it should be I'm assuming confirm if I'm wrong Tamara but at the project website on the, on OPRE's website all the new resources that will be coming out in the coming months will be there as well as the literature review and the theory of change which are there. That is correct. Good. Okay. So that's that link is in the chat for everybody, um, and you can keep checking back there and. Um, so again, thinking about that, um, uh, we had some conversation about how, you know, there's the individual focus strategies and then the organizational focused and that there are, there are results and impact you can have with those individual level um, services and approaches. Um, and, but there are also things that you don't get from that where you really need that organizational um, engagement and sustained and, and buy-in. We talked about buy-in, like organizational buy-in, and if you don't have that, um, and so that's something that's added when you move on over to a, a BSC-like approach in quadrants three or a whole center-wide approach in quadrant four. Um, and uh, so I think in, in when that brief comes out, one of the things that you'll see is um, the idea that some approaches can be combinations or can live on a spectrum and that each that services in each of those four quadrants have benefits and they offer something. Um, so kind of the question is, what are the needs um, when it comes to quality and workforce professional development and how do you know, our services that are currently offered meeting those needs and achieving those results, or is there a different balance or a shift or addition that 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 can help um, to have a better likelihood of achieving um, impact. So again, a tool for really reflecting on what's happening now um, and where are their gaps and what might fill that gap. Um, the group also talked a little bit about kind of are there any areas or domains of practice or quality that are most in need of something like a BSC that's really equipped to close the gap between what people know, because sometimes people know a lot, they're quite knowledgeable, but it, you don't know it from looking at the practice, it's not translated. So some things are harder to translate to practice. So one area that, that we talked a little bit about was about um, uh, individualizing instruction and what a challenging um, area of or domain of quality that is and that's an area that could um, could benefit from a BSC. Uh, the group also talked about the challenges of of COVID um, and the um, just the the context for early childhood programs in terms of compensation, turnover, um, staffing shortages, um, the things that make it virtually impossible for programs to engage, for individuals or programs to engage in professional development and quality improvement right now, and the importance of system level efforts to address those factors that interfere with programs capacity to engage in, in high impact um, quality improvement and professional learning. We talked about paid protect, protected paid planning time um, and what would it take to achieve that. Um, and if we, if the science is right um, and the research is right, that you really don't get sustained improvement um, if adults in the workplace can't collaborate in learning together, um, then, then that becomes a really important priority. 
and then the last thing we talked about was oh some of the connections with with um, other things people might be doing with improvement science um, and thinking about what what is improvement uh, science uh, or implementation science sorry um, very two related things implementation and improvement science um, Tamara has a brief or uh, a chapter on that very topic if anyone's interested um, but implementation science and using some of those approaches that really focus on how you get buy-in at multiple levels or engage with teams of people um, so just kind of that same uh, kind of wisdom about the importance of that so that was what what our group talked about um, and if if I missed anything anyone can can jump in um, and but um, I think are are we um, turning it over um, faith are you closing yeah. this out or should okay I sure am yes yes I am so thank you so very much um, Dr. Douglas and Dr. Haley for sharing your content and information um, that really increased our knowledge about the breakthrough science collaborative methodology um, and walking through the examples and really helping us to make the connection with quality improvement um, I think I found this to be very informative. I wasn't very familiar. Um, so I really do appreciate all of the really, um, it was just great information and it was very easy to digest. So I appreciate that. Um, before we close out, I'd like to share a couple of resources with you all um, just so that you can um, continue your learning. Um, first, I'd like to share it. Um, one of the places is the PDG Birth to 5 TA Center's website. Um, and well, a couple of things. First, I'm going to put um, the link for this into the chat so that you can have um, access to it if you're not familiar with where this is. Um, there you go. Um, and so this is um, a place where you can find different resources to like strengthen, um, to help states strengthen and enhance their um, mixed delivery um, systems for birth to five. So. And then the other um, resource page is Research Connections, and I will also put that in there. Um, it's an online library of policy relevant research. It contains lots of information about the topics that you um, that we will be covering um, throughout the annual convening um, about, and can also like help states with their um, systems building as well as enhancing on um, specific topics. And other than that, I'd like to thank you participants for joining us. We appreciate your attention and we hope that you will enjoy the rest of the convening.